Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this uh, special ev uh, Talking EMBA event. Uh, I'm Nick Argyris. I think many of you know me. I know many of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the academic director of the EMBA program, a professor of strategy. Uh, this is the first in uh, a number of events we're going to be having celebrating the 40-year anniversary of the EMBA program. Round of applause, yes. <clears throat> uh, our big celebration is going to be in um, a weekend in September. Uh, in addition, there's going to be another one of these Talking EMBA sessions uh, next month, so be on the lookout for that on um, hospital mergers. Uh, tonight, we are going to focus on pivoting, and uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful Ron King, Professor Emeritus of Accounting. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Well, it's uh, very great to be here. I'd like to welcome all uh, those in person and those online. Um, super to have this opportunity. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Ron King. I've had the pleasure and privilege of working with EMBAS for a long time. It's been uh, something that's added to my balance sheet of life. So it's uh, great, to, great to see many friends uh, here today. Um, the topic today is uh, pivots, and the concept of pivots has a long history in physics and engineering and in sports, but in the social science, the concept of pivot is more ambiguous. But most people, when you think about the idea of a pivot in the social science arena, you think about an uh, element of change, an important change, a pivotal change. Uh, some people think about this as maybe a defining moment or a point of inflection. However you think about it in a social science point of view, a pivot has more art than science. That the idea of understanding the science behind pivots is certainly something that's very nuanced. But to contribute to this, uh, we've got two stellar members uh, on the panel tonight who are going to give us insights into the cadence that they've gone through in important pivots for their profession and business life. So while our topic today is on the concept of pivots, the purpose of this meeting, although we talk about pivot with purpose, is to build community. Uh, in some sense, we, we'll talk more about this in just a second, that a university has a lot of functions, but one is to build a community relationship capital. So uh, this is the underlying purpose that we have here. So if we uh, get started, I'd like to thank, there's six people here, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, but these people all marshal the energies to make this possible. Uh, and again, we hope we can create a flywheel for future events going forward. So thanks to all the uh, people here. Uh, Amy's at the Bauer Leadership Center and Brooke is our marketing person. And of course, you know, Corey, Darlene, Don, and Mary. Uh, after we finish here, and there's free booze, buy them a drink, because uh, I think they'll, they'll appreciate it. Um, so the agenda is, is really quite simple. The core of the agenda is our, our two panelists. Uh, but I'd like to start by just putting this in context. Uh, um, I don't know about you, but every time I step foot on Washington, Washington University, there's something meaningful about the history of universities. You think about universities, they've got a longer tradition than most every other institution. And there's some religions that have uh, longevity greater, but few governments and few uh, uh, man-made institutions have the longevity. And in some sense, people talk about university in a disparaging sense and say, we're teaching the same way today that we did 500 or 1,000 years ago. And you know, one can quibble with that, but in some sense, there's something really remarkable about that that the universities have had such staying power, that there's something fundamental to the process. Now, in part, it's a coming of age element, but uh, I'm a real big fan of universities. Uh, I encourage those of you who have the opportunity, come on campus on Halloween, because that's the day you're gonna see physics professors interacting with you know, co-eds dressed as witches, people coming in all kinds of weird garb, and it's really a melting pot of kind of an interesting time. So um, put it on your calendar, Halloween. Um, 
universities have three functions. One is to do research, two is to educate, and three is to certify that education. And in many cases, that's what a university does is certify that you've got an undergraduate degree or a PhD. There's a certification that has currency in the marketplace. The EMBA program does those three things, but it does more. The EMBA program is fundamentally a platform for building relationship capital, where people know other people that together they can do more together than individually. And I think this idea of community builder, which both of our speakers are today, um, community builder is someone who is willing to make personal sacrifice to build the good of the, uh, of the consensus group, of the communal group. Um, tell a little story real quickly here. This last weekend, I went up to Wisconsin where I attended my 50th anniversary for my junior year abroad. And uh, I went to Europe 1972-73, which, you know, you guys were, your parents were still unborn at that point. But uh, anyway, I um, went to Europe with 110 other people, and it was a very strange time. It was during the Vietnam War. Copenhagen was a den of inequity that we were ready for, partially. Um, but it was a real event. And when I went back to this reunion, of the 110, more than half of the people who are still alive were at this reunion. And then I compare that to my other friends and my other contacts at the university where I, I spent four years, where I don't know anyone. It was this transformational year where embedded in this group where you're forged by challenge. You're forged together by common activities you go through. And that's what relationship capital really does is that you build these bonds from challenge, from uh, uh, opportunities to engage in self-learning, but also helping others. So uh, that's the AMBA program fundamentally. It builds this relationship capital. And this panel today, Pivot with Purpose, is part of, is just a manifestation of that. So our purpose here is to get the insights, but you know, my hope is at the end that hopefully you maybe get some ideas, maybe potentially inspired, maybe make new contacts, but hopefully you make a note to say, how can I give and, and give to others or, or contribute in a way that continues this flywheel of reputational capital? I encourage you to do that. So um, what I'm gonna do is, uh, uh, talk a few more things about the um, uh, idea of a pivot, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Nate, but you said a pivot is a special kind of change, is a pivotal change. And many people see a pivot as an environmental change. You know, I move, a circumstance, I get promoted, or I get married, or uh, maybe my business is taken over, or I start a business. But what I'd like you to, Keep in mind as you hear the discussion today is the idea of a mindset association with that pivot. Because if we simply move to a different place but keep the same mindset or take a job in a, in a different point with the same mindset, it's probably not completing the arc of that experience. So it's really the mindset that is in some sense pivotal, not the experience necessarily of the change in circumstances or the change in environment. So um, my pivot recently, and I'm not gonna go into this, but if during Q&A there is uh, an interest, you know, I started investing. And I think it was maybe back when, when Nate was here that somebody came up uh, during break when I was teaching and said, um, you know, uh, have you invested in these startups so when we were comparing notes about startups? And I hadn't. And so I, at that time I thought I was going to spend the amount of money people were spending as students getting an MBA I was gonna to try to invest that uh, as, a, as a starting point. And uh, it was a super pivotal thing. It changed my mindset. I felt like I was a better teacher. There's a lot of benefits from that pivot. But let me just summarize here. We are gonna have two people talk about their pivots and try to show you the art and the science of their experience. But the hope is that it raises the questions and builds this community. Uh, we'll ask that questions will be delayed till the second half, and um, then we'll open up for questions, but we'll have a, a full half hour. So with that, let me introduce Mr. Nate Leafy.
Thanks, Ron, uh, for organizing this session and for the invitation to speak. It's a real honor. And uh, as I'm sure is the case with everyone else in this room who studied at WashU Business School, uh, you were one of my favorite professors to study under and uh, also one of my favorite people to share a beverage with. And I look forward to the beverage promise that we were given um, after this session. Yes. <laughs> You know, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time was Peyton Manning. And uh, one quality Manning possessed was his ability to read the defense. And what he would do is he would have these long cadences as he approached the line. And he would get the defense to jump and show them their hand. And then he would approach the line and call an audible. And when Ron said, you know, can you speak on a pivot? Automatically, the audible came to mind. Here's a clip where they have to show this. Consecutive. Red zone possessions. He caught him. He saw the blitz was coming by waiting so long, so now he can protect himself against the blitz. With one on the play clock, and the pass goes back to Hillman. Hillman down the sidelines to the end zone. You see. So. When, I, when we founded Orion Genomics, I moved from Boston, Massachusetts, and we chose to live, to move to uh, St. Louis to be near the McDonald Genome Sequencing Center, or the McDonald Genome Institute at WashU. And that's because my co-founder was the director of that institute. Orion specializes in reading information that's encoded in DNA. And we have the aim of developing tests that can provide information that, that enables important decisions to be made. So our initial play call, I'm gonna talk about a pivot, where the initial call was one thing, but it didn't work out and we had to pivot. So this is the initial play call, was to develop a simple blood test which could identify people who are at risk of developing colon cancer in the future. And as you know, colon cancer is an awful disease. More than 150,000 people are diagnosed each year with this and some 40 to 50,000 people die from colon cancer annually. It's the second uh, most common cause of cancer-related death in the United States. And this is because, unfortunately, most people are diagnosed with colon cancer after it is spread when intervention has uh, less of an impact on survival. So uh, we had a patented biomarker, which was in a region of the human genome, which controlled the imprint of a potent growth factor called IGF-2. A growth factor in layman's terms, causes cells to divide quickly. And so it's an important signal in the cancer uh, cascade. Um, in layman's terms, the copy of this gene that you inherited from your mother was tightly packaged and it was turned off. But the copy of the gene you inherited from your dad was not tightly packaged and could be expressed. And so normally you get one dose, not two doses, one dose of this potent growth factor. Well, in some retrospective studies, patients who were diagnosed with polyps during their first colonoscopy were three and a half times to five times more likely to have lost that imprint throughout the lining of their colon. So what that means is that the cells that line their colon were exposed to this potent growth factor. And if they were diagnosed with a polyp, they were three and a half times to five times more likely to have it than people uh, who were not diagnosed with polyps. Similarly, folks who are diagnosed with cancer were 21.7 times more likely to have lost this imprint throughout the entirety of their colon. So our idea was if we could predict who had this double dose of a growth factor, maybe we could find people who were at risk of getting cancer in the future. They could be screened more and they would get caught earlier and not die uh, from the terrible disease. So in order to prove that this worked, we got access to a massive clinical trial that was in its 18th year, where 75,000 people had given blood 18 years earlier, and they were screened uh, with colonoscopy. And then they were screened every two years from that point forward. And what we were interested in is, would our biomarker be present in the blood of people who were normal but ended up getting cancer, but be absent in the blood of people who were normal and never developed cancer. And if that were the case in a beautiful study like this, then we would be able to market our test as a risk test. So it was a, a blinded study, double blinded. 
Um, we, we, in order to do this, we had to build a clinical lab, which we built here in St. Louis, uh, uh, a CLIA lab, um, thousands of pages of documentation. We, we made assays that were incredibly linear. Those of you who are scientists, the error bars are actually there. It's a very linear test. We did all this work, we're unblinded, and um, we had no statistical significance. So that was kind of a bummer. Um, we thought we'd change the world. And so we had to, we had to pivot. And what we did was to pivot to the other side of the earth. And on the other side of the earth, there's a crop that grows that feeds a majority of the world's population. The crop thrives in the equatorial regions that have high rainfall. So we established subsidiary companies in both Malaysia and Indonesia. This is our facility. This, this is a condo that I have. This is our lab in Kuala Lumpur, um, Malaysia. And um, uh, what, it's kind of a pivot. <laughs> oil palm is 10 times more productive than soy at making edible oil. It's, it's only planted on 5% of the land in the world that, that's used to grow edible oil, yet that 5% produces 40% of global supply, a phenomenally productive crop. Um, in fact, there are 2.7 billion oil palms, palm trees, that grow this fruit uh, in cultivation today, which is about two trees for every family of five. This is my family of five when I was a bit younger. Um, so interestingly, it was known from decades of breeding that there's a single gene that controls an incredibly important trait in oil palm yield. This gene is called the shell gene. And uh, if, if you have two functional copies of the shell gene, you get this really thick fibrous shell. It's like a little coconut shell. And that is so thick that the orange fruit, which has the oil, is really thin. And this tree isn't very productive. And so it has 44% of the yield that a, uh, the ideal tree would have. And, and the growers that plant it uh, lose $422 of yield that they could have had if they planted a good tree. If you have two mutant copies of the shell gene, there's no shell. And actually, this fruit can't be used at all for oil production. Um, what you want is a tree that has one mutant copy and one normal copy of the gene. So the shell is thin, the fruit is really thick, and this tree has 100% yield. The problem is this trait doesn't show up. Trees don't fruit until they've been in the field for four years. And by then, you can't chop it down and replant it because you have canopy cover. So, so growers basically write off that bad tree for 30 years, a real problem. But if you can look at the DNA and figure out what portion of the genome encodes for this gene, you could actually test nursery seedlings or seeds and predict which palms are gonna be productive and then only plant those. So this was the concept that we pivoted to away from uh, cancer. So we partnered with the Malaysian Palm Oil Board. We sequenced the oil palm genome and then um, did a study where we found a single gene on chromosome two that encoded for a Madsbox transcription factor, which was the shell gene. And by studying thousands of trees that were segregating for the trait, we actually found nine different mutations that each would individually predict the phenotype of a palm in the future. So we, um, we, we built a high throughput lab over there that could do millions of samples a year uh, in injection molding, custom uh, laser marking, custom pipetting to do DNA extraction specifically for palm. And, uh, and then we, we turned this lab loose on a large scale census of the supply chain in Malaysia and Indonesia. And in that census, we actually sampled more than 1.2 million samples throughout all growing regions of palm in Southeast Asia. And what we found was pretty remarkable. The goal is to have no genetically inferior trees in the field because genetically inferior trees have lower yield, right? But in Malaysia, shockingly, we found 12.7% of the trees were genetically inferior. And in the Indonesian smallholder sector, 73.5% of the palms that they're growing are genetically inferior. The legal limit for this contamination is 5% in Malaysia and it's 2% in Indonesia. So Indonesia is what? 36 times the legal limit 
of contamination in the supply chain. So what we found working with economists with the government is that in Malaysia, if you use this gene test, you can predict which trees are gonna be productive and only plant those. And if they do that and remove the contamination, they'll have $1.6 billion of additional oil yield annually. And in Indonesia, they'll have $10.6 billion of additional yield each year. So currently we're setting up a network of DNA labs throughout Southeast Asia. We already have one in Malaysia right now uh, in Medan, Indonesia. A national DNA lab is being constructed to do this technique. We'll build up DNA preparation facilities throughout the growing regions. And the idea is to collect samples to the preparation facility and then ship DNA over to the central DNA testing lab where we can do this test, then plant idea to improve the sustainability of the oil palm industry. It's been a real rewarding experience to do this pivot. In fact, we've had some really great international press where various periodicals have pointed out that using DNA technology like this can help oil palm become more sustainable. We even got a comment from Harrison Ford who commented on the project and said, this is gonna really help an industry become more sustainable. And we were recently featured in the BBC as a disruptor of, of global markets. So pivoting pays off, but it takes courage. And sometimes it can bring you to the other side of the world. So it's been a real honor to now work on a new problem, which is to manage the balance between the equilibrium of the wild natural rainforest and land that's dedicated to growing oil palm. You gotta feed the world, but you also need the carbon sequestration of the rainforest to keep, it's the lungs of the earth. And so both are needed. And we're now using technologies and we're optimistic that we can help manage that boundary. So my question to you is, is it time for a pivot? And uh, it's been a great honor for me to be the warm up act for Cabany, who is a good colleague of mine and a friend for years. And she's gonna give a fantastic presentation. So thanks. Thank you, Nate. I don't know about you, but I was getting sweaty when it came to him figuring out if it was gonna work or not. I feel like going after Nate makes me feel like he had real guts in that pivot. So as I thought about how to approach tonight's um, discussion, and thank you so much, Professor King, for inviting me. When he called, I said, whatever you need, I would be glad to do it. So um, I was honored to be included tonight, and I thought about what is a professional and personal pivot? So maybe to pivot from what is a very compelling professional pivot that Nate just shared. I wanted to share a little bit about my own personal journey and then marry that up with a little bit of the professional. So um, I think I know why Professor King thought of me um, when he first called. Like, I looked at your LinkedIn. I saw that you've done a lot in the time that you've been in the EMBA program, and he was right. And I think that throughout my entire educational and professional journey, it's somewhat been um, a source of um, shame or embarrassment that I've done a lot. And now looking backwards, I love this quote by Steve Jobs, um, that you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking back. And like I could just get teary because as an art history major, I think going through the professional world, it's like, well, why would you go to University of Pennsylvania and spend you know, $150,000 to learn about paintings? Like, I heard that so much. And for a young person, it's very discouraging. So whatever brought you here tonight, thank you for being here. And if it's for your own professional journey, I hope you learn something. And if it's for even a child, I've heard from a lot of people who go, oh my God, thank you, please talk to my child. They're a psychology major and I'm so worried about them. And it's been amazing now being able to look back and say like, you can chart your own path. It doesn't have to be linear. There are amazing accountants and lawyers and doctors that have to be linear because we've all probably heard of or read the tipping point. Like some level of expertise for certain professions is wildly needed. So we have to have that. But what if you're a person who's maybe more on the creative side of things and you've had much more of a quilt background? So that's what I'm gonna talk about. So. Um, I'm a non-traditional student and also business professional. And one of the things I love about EMBA, I met so many people who were making a pivot, right? You're at that point in your career where it's like, 
what am I going to do next? And this becomes, I think, very much a ground, uh, a research ground for figuring out your next move. And that's certainly what it was for me. So um, I think that really, for me, looking back, the dots are connected by first, my love of art history, and also French, but I don't even mention it, because I think people are extra, like, why 150 for four years of French and art history? But I was both. And it was because I loved liberal arts. And I now look back and I think liberal arts is an amazing way to start your um, educational journey if you take it as a way to understand how to think critically. So the first part of my educational journey after graduating um, high school was to go to University of Pennsylvania. I started art history and French. I studied abroad, so I very much related to that that story, Professor King. And I think that once I saw in myself, I'm at the number one business school in the world, arguably, depending on what US News and World Report you look at, but I'm at Wharton. So I took a couple of classes thinking like, okay, there is something in me that loves business, but I wasn't really ready to do that as a, a full-time course of study. So I, um, took a couple of classes, but then while there, I saw in myself that I loved art history. I learned how to think critically. You actually have to write a lot as an art history major, so that was my foundation. But when I graduated, I took it upon myself to really look at, okay, I want to pivot away from, I'm not an artist, I study artists, but I'm not necessarily the traditional creative type. So I went out and I worked for a couple of startups. That was a very eye-opening, interesting experience. I wore all the hats. And then I decided I wanted to see the inside of a publicly traded company. I want to understand how that works. And so I fought my way, literally had to convince so many people that I could do it because they would look at my resume. And now I feel for younger people because it's like resume machines kind of look for keywords. And if you don't have it, they spit you out. And so I had to literally try to find my way through a side door my team now calls it third door thinking. They joke about it like she can run through a brick wall. And I kind of had to do that to convince a Fortune 500 that I was worth hiring in a communications role. And I worked my way up. And while there, I enrolled in EMBA. And it was so powerful. And I always will remember Professor King fondly because I was able to learn accounting. And I studied strategy. And I did organizational behavior. And all of a sudden, it stirred in me. And actually, at some of your places, I've put um, a matchbox from our company. And I feel like it lit a fire in me that I knew I also had the left brain thinking as well as the creativity. And so whatever that fire is, whatever that, you know, flicker or match um, that might be lit under you or someone that you love, listen to that. And I think that if you have something that stokes that fire in you, you will likely be successful at it because it gets you out of bed. You want to go do it. So that was really the eye opener for me when I was at Wash U is I loved some of that. I mean, accounting, I knew I would never be a full-time accountant, but there were certain aspects of it where, you know, being able to study a PL was very helpful to me when I ultimately did go out on my own. And I think for um, today, what I wanted to talk about as far as the professional pivot is, honestly, the marketing firm that I started eight years ago um, relies very heavily on both sides, the left and the right brain. I think a lot about dynamic solutions to complex problems. And I don't even have marketing in our tagline. We say that we bring the complex into focus. And for me, what that meant was in corporate America, I felt like I was in so many boardrooms and everybody was like, I have an idea, I wanna do this thing, but you know, no one had actually the tactical wherewithal to get, get it to the finish line. So being able to take very disparate ideas and thoughts and bring them into focus and then move them forward kind of became our, our reason for being. So I merged my love of startups and Fortune 500 and put it to work to try and sell our services. And that was eight years ago. And I'm so proud of what we've built today. I feel like those moments that I consider really defining moments where I worked at an art gallery. I worked at Sotheby's Auction House. I tried a lot of things. And so for me, the trial and error was so critical and not getting beaten down by so many people who midway through my time at Penn, I probably should have pivoted and gone, you know what, art history is probably not the most commercially viable, but God bless my parents. They were all for it. They supported me. And now as a parent, I think about, am I going to steer my child towards something like computer science where I know they'll be able to be gamefully employed? Or am I going to stoke and really try and celebrate maybe something that they're showing a real interest in? So that's something I'm really exploring now is like, do I think that people can do it? And was it good for me? Or was it something I had to overcome? But I'm very proud of it. And I think that today, who I seek to hire is very much informed by this. 
when people come to our company, I'm so keen to understand if they have that analytical bend, but that can they also be creative? And to me, that's the unicorn. That is really the skill set that I'm going. You can chart your path a lot of places when you can demonstrate the ability to, you know, offer good judgment, bring creativity and analysis. So I will choose these individuals over highly specialized, particularly because we are in a very dynamic industry. Like digital marketing, I picked that for a reason. It's always evolving, it's always changing. So I need people who have a degree in thinking on their feet, which has been really fun. And it helps me also reward those people who may not have had a linear background. I go, I don't care, it's fine. And, though, and they've probably heard often in their career like, so paint the picture for me, tell me how that works. And I said, oh, I love our logo too. It's about the kaleidoscope and my husband's in the audience. He helped me kind of articulate the idea that like, I go, I wanna help people bring disparate parts into a beautiful cohesive outcome. And it was really the kaleidoscope that became the um, really symbol for who we are and what we do. And I also say it's like a quilt, you know, professional backgrounds that are more quilt-like than linear, I'm attracted to that. And it's really served our company well. And I later learned from a client that a kaleidoscope is also a term for a flock of butterflies. And so I think that's also a very beautiful analogy that was totally accidental, but we are a company that's constantly transforming and trying to find beauty where maybe other people don't see it. So, um, I think really for me, I wanted to come here tonight and share my own story, not to necessarily pontificate, but to instill um, some thoughts in you guys to really create a very fruitful and hopefully robust Q&A. I like this because this has become really the values for our company. And I, I think a lot about JD, MBA, um, BA, the, the degrees that we put behind our names. And these are the letters and the acronym that I'm very proud to have behind my name. Um, and they represent what we show up for as our team and to our clients. And to me, these are letters that really stand for what we're all about and how you experience me as a team member or how you experience me if you hire us. Excellent listening skills. Are we highly engaged? Do we show some level of gratitude for each other and the opportunity to do this work that we love so much? Are we able to act with urgency? I'm always instilling that, especially in some of the younger generations. I have a bias for action. And it's like, if it's been a little too long, it's like, how can we show up in a way that shows that we really care and that we are prioritizing our clients' work? And then proactivity. I mean, I will hire all day long for someone who might be able to anticipate needs. So I think that oftentimes, you know, being able to understand that at certain junctures in your career or in your, in your, in your education, there are times where you're going to need to make very intentional moves. And only looking back, can we really maybe connect those dots or see it as a beautiful quilt versus sheepishly, oh, I switched jobs or I, I, they're not going to understand. I totally switched industries, but I think our society is becoming a little bit more open to that. And that excites me because I would prefer to work around very interesting, dynamic people with lots of different um, past experience all day long. So this was actually a really wonderful quote just in closing that spoke to me. And not surprisingly, when um, Professor King and I first spoke, he said, have you read Range? Well, I subsequently went to read it and I thought, wow, the challenge we all face is how to maintain the benefits of breadth, diverse experience, interdisciplinary thinking, and delayed concentration in a world that increasingly incentivizes and even demands hyper-specialization. So I really like that, and I hope for the future that we are gonna be moving toward a world that celebrates and absolutely needs that narrow specialty and area of hyper-specialization, but also celebrate those that may not have that same level of linearity um, in their path. So again, I wanted to keep it somewhat brief, but share enough of my story that we could have a really robust Q&A. And I just can't thank you enough. And thank you all for coming out. I know how precious time is. I love seeing some of my friends and colleagues in the audience. And yeah, please connect with me. Again, I put matches at several seats, hoping that you guys will find that spark in yourself and listen to it because I think it can unlock um, a tremendous potential. Thank you. Well, thank you both. This is very inspirational. I appreciate that. And um, I think what we'd like to do is um, move to the Q&A section. And you know, there requires a little bit of um, uh, nimble thinking here to, to manage this. Uh, Corey here has a microphone. So if uh, there's someone who has a question, oh, we have, we have two questions, Don. Uh, anyone has a question for our panel? And then, uh, and after we take a couple of questions here, we'll see if there's anyone online who might have a question. So for Orion Genomics, 
when you made your pivot from doing um, uh, cancer screening, essentially, to POM, um, that's, that's a, there were many other opportunities at that time, right? I mean, there were many more in healthcare and certainly more in, in cancer genomics at that time. Why POM? And how much, how much evaluation did you do before you made that switch? So that's a great question. So uh, two of my company founders are professors at Cold Spring Harbor. And the chancellor of Cold Spring Harbor at the time was Jim Watson, so Watson and Crick. And uh, the Asians uh, wanted to get a, um, an opinion on how they might discover this gene because breeders had found that the shell gene was segregating in 1940. Hmm. And they all knew that if they could have a way to read this gene, that they, you know, they could have a big impact on, on performance. So Jim Watson went out to meet them and, and to give a seminar. And they asked him, what should we do? And, and we had just started Orion. Uh, uh, and and uh, well, it was a, a bit after we had started Orion. So Jim Watson made the introduction hmm. to the Malaysians. And, uh, you know, of course, they're, they're going to do what he says. He's Jim <laughs> Watson. <laughs> so um, he said, you should talk to Nate and, and his team at Orion because they have a really good technique for finding genes and building tests, and that That's might awesome. be a good thing. So they invited me out, and uh, I met them, and I, I knew nothing about palm oil. But after meeting them and, and having many dinners, as, as you do as you develop business relationships in Asia, uh, I fell in love with with the people and the land and really understood the power of this crop. And so to a DNA guy, DNA, you know, if, if it's alive, it has DNA. <laughs> um, even some dead things like viruses have DNA. So uh, it, 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 from a technical standpoint, it wasn't as big a pivot. But from a market application, of course, it was a huge, it was a huge pivot. So is it Great fair question. to say it was a mutual pivot that you pivoted and they pivoted and it was a happy coincidence that it mm -hmm. worked think, out that. I think that's a sweet way to think of it because um, as DNA technology has moved into various fields, there's sort of a traditional approach that's threatened by the new approach for, for mm -hmm. DNA. This is happening in pathology. It's happening in, in you know, uh, all, uh, all phylogenies, people that look at um, family trees of different species. There's one way to do it. And, and when the DNA comes in, it's a completely different way of thinking. And so they had to pivot from traditional breeding to genomics. And, uh, and, and they had someone like a sensei in Jim Watson to, to advise them that they should do it. But we had to pivot from US thinking and US problems, which we all focus on cancer, especially in this area right up the street is one of the top cancer centers in the world. They sequence two thirds of all the genes in the human genome. And this is a famous part of the world it's all human focused. Mm -hmm. uh, Nate, I've got another question for you. Um, so was the strategy to accumulate a series of kind of parking lot opportunities that may have been outside of human use? Um, because I, I obviously in clinical trials, as a startup, those companies almost always die <laughs> in a failed trial. So was that always the strategy or was that a little bit of luck in there too? It's Professor Zinger, right, Todd? Pardon? Uh, I know Jim Howard. Jim, okay. I you look. He does look like professor. Anyway, um, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, so you can we call were me professor if you want our to. Um, <laughs> our our investors were individuals. They weren't um, venture capitalists. And venture capitalists often raise money, and they have a timetable of ten years. And they they got to pay their fund back in ten years. So, and, and and it takes them five or six years to put the money in. So if you're late in their spend, you got to get an exit in four years, five years. So they basically steer you because of this artificial timeline about value creation. They steer you on a project that will pay, give an answer within that window. And if it doesn't work, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So they diversify by having 20 projects, 20 different companies. But the individuals that give their career and move their families to a new town have no diversification at all. Do you follow me? So what we did, our, our, my private investors were open to having multiple shots on goal. Mm -hmm. And that was really a product of our investor structure. That's great. They, they allowed that. Plus they hired someone that is all over the place. And so <laughs> I had other ideas. Uh, That's great. So the day of that failed trial, the news comes out and you saw this red line coming up. You, you did a 
walk away. Or think about walking away, because that's, I mean, that's a detrimental personal experience, obviously. Or is it like, let's just move on? I there was some reasons. overlap. I mean, we had started the other project as a service to sequence the genome. And we were making money doing that. Um, and the question was, uh, do we hang it up? Or do I come to the board with an idea that's worth keeping the company going? We were profitable at the time. I was paying my investors back. And so they weren't feeling the pain of having to put in. But um, it was a pitch. I made a pivot pitch to the board. Let's go hard. This is a, an important. And in fact, it's, it's kind of fun because I got to present both of these projects to my class in 2009, EMBA 32, and several of my team members are here. So thanks for coming. And, and they were concepts back then, but it's not a concept anymore. Kavani, this question's for you. And yeah. as someone who's also creative, I'm really curious. Um, sometimes we have a lot of big ideas, and I'd imagine you might be a woman who has had a lots of big ideas about what you could do with all your gifts. And I was curious if you maybe have advice or guidance around like, how do you personally choose what to prioritize in terms of the big things you'd like to see happen in the world or the things you'd like to do? That's a great question. I think that's the quandary for a lot of creatives. We have lots of big ideas and which ones do we chase because we don't want to um, get fatigued from chasing them. So I think for me, the answer was, I got to a place where I knew I loved art and I loved art history, but I liked it as a hobby. And once I knew in my heart that I was a business person, I realized that I could actually continue to love art, travel to see art, do all the things that I love. Because I see so many, even in my art history experience, working at a gallery and then at an auction house, you see a lot of people who chase the dream and the passion and it loses its passion because they starving artists, right? That phrase exists for a reason. And so I'm really grateful and I love to be a, a resource for creative types that I want to be able to have both. I want to be able to freely pay my bills and I want to pay a really healthy wage to people who are creative types with marketing degrees or journalism degrees. And it's like, how can we have that balance? And so for me, the answer was go after the thing that I knew was marketable and I could still enjoy my life. It happens to be in a creative field, but you can earn a really healthy living that way and then go see art. I love to acquire, buy, support local artists. And so I think working for my gallery owner um, was really eye-opening. I loved him and he's a really successful gallerist in New York and in St. Louis. And once I started seeing, he was buying Ellsworth Kelly's and you know um, Helen Frankenthaler's and I loved his collection. I just sat next to him and I saw how he worked his real estate biz over here and his art business over here and one fueled the other. And so I took a note from that and I thought you don't wanna have the thing that you love ultimately be the thing that is shackling you. I hope that helps. Any other questions or questions online? We have one question online. Yeah, hi. Um, sorry, I'm kind of doing this from my backyard. So if you hear a crazy <laughs> dog go by, I apologize. Um, so Kamadi, I, I, I guess it's more of a comment for you. Um, but I was, you know, extremely inspired by what you said. Um, I'm a physician, a radiologist, but I'm also the son of an artist. And I just see so much potential at the intersection of art, science, medicine, that... Uh, there's the dog um, that I just I, I see as kind of this untapped field um, that I, 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 I don't know I, I feel like our professions the artists put themselves into a silo and business puts themselves into a silo and I think it's just great that you were able to bridge that gap and then Nathan I, I guess a, a little bit of a follow-up from that last question um, you, you know, you, you talked about being able to, to meet James Watson and all this. How do you, I guess, how important is your network in finding these opportunities? You know, that's quite a pivot to go from cancer research to crop research, but, but you did it and did it well. Um, you know, how, 
I, I don't think that's something that, you know, just would have come to you out of the blue. I don't know, maybe it would, but uh, how do you get these great people on your team? I guess is kind of the, the essence of my question. Well, you, you picked up on a nuance that's, that's really important, and I, I didn't mention it, but thank you for, for asking. Um, the, your network is key. It's absolutely key. Uh, in my very first career job, um, I had the privilege of going to an annual scientific con conference, and this was to figure out how to sequence the human genome, and there was nobody doing it back then. This is in the you know, early 90s, and I, I, learned, I met people uh, and I've gone every year, and now it's thousands and thousands of people, and they're they're building companies and um, directing the National Institutes of Health and all. You know, they're friends, and um, you know, so you have to have a network, and it's at those meetings that you hear ideas, and it's those ideas that you apply when you synthesize um, a new concept. So, uh, if it wasn't for the network, we we wouldn't have done either project. Great question. We have one more question online, uh, Rob. Yeah, hello. Um, I had a question um, to you both. When you decided to pivot your company strategy, um, did you find you needed to change the culture at your company? And what were your toughest challenges with pivoting? And how did you overcome those challenges? I mean, you want to go first? I think that's for you. Is that for me? Mm -hmm. um, to both. To both. <laughs> both. Okay. Um, I think for me, it was knowing that, kind of back to the earlier question that was asked of me, I got to that point where when I felt that I knew that business was going to be core to my future, I didn't know how, but I knew it was going to be, I had to make that intentional investment in the EMBA really, I think, to be taken seriously. And it helped me really get my confidence up to where when someone would look at my resume and go, ooh, art history and French, no, next, even though I knew I could do it. Once I got inside the walls of this Fortune 500, I was tearing it up, moving and grooving on private jets to Australia. Like, we figured it out, and I contributed a lot. But the getting them to believe me required some level of um, credentialization. So the pivot for me to make sure that like I had that was to invest in coming to Wash U and really just to be taken seriously. So um, I think by the time I knew I was going to be in business, really the rest for me was more linear. I got linear as I got further along because I had the corporate Fortune 500. I saw what other marketing firms were doing. I saw that I could do it better. And I kind of had a very laser laser launch to having my own company. So I got more linear actually as time went on. So my answer to that question, um, the, uh, we had a very creative team, a very great research team. And for the, the cancer project, at one point we had to build a clinical lab. And the, the philosophy of a clinical lab is really different from the philosophy of basic research. In a clinical lab, you don't want to change anything. You want to do everything exactly the same way according mm -hmm. to the documents. And you can never, ever, ever you know, tweak anything. So we had to build a little culture within the company to, to conduct the trial with excellence. And so we hired a clinical lab team and gave them their own space and they had their own world. Um, the creative R&D side pivoted beautifully because it, it worked out. And, um, and I would say half of the clinical team bought into this and they were very excited about trying something completely new. The other half uh, didn't like the change. And they, they decided you know, to move on. We, we didn't lay them off. Um, we gave, gave them jobs working on the new project. But one thing that was great is actually the culture of our clinical lab allowed us to build these labs in Asia. And um, my, uh, um, the, the regulators wanted to prove that we are accurate. And so they would mix blinded samples in with the 1.2 million samples that we did. And uh, they did 11 batches of blinded samples, thousands of them. And each time they would show us how, how we did, we were 100% reporting. So every one of the samples they gave us, we gave a result back. And they were 100% accurate on 11 individual batches. So I was shocked by that. And, uh, and it was a culture of our clinical lab that stayed alive in the pivot 
and made us this ridiculously accurate ag DNA company. Like, do you really care if your palm tree is bad? Well, if you're the one who has that palm tree and you're losing 400 bucks, you do care. Um, so uh, it, that was tough. I think I had to sell the pivot to the board, but even more importantly, to our, our team. Can I talk about the, for both of you, Cabany. Cabany. You talked about it a bit already. I think Nate could give a good, concise uh, capture of his, in the con your pivot in the context of the EMBA. Because as I got to know you and then as I hear you right now, I don't know who all is in the audience thinking about going to the EMBA, but I might be wondering, why did you even bother going to the EMBA? Um, you were positioned pretty well in the beginning. So, and by the way, I wanted to say to Kaveny, you're the first person I've ever heard articulate very similarly uh, as I did to people who reported to me and then uh, when I advised students and such about simplifying complexity, connecting the dots, the value of the humanities education. Uh, it's consistent, I think, not just with the book range, but I think with, I can't remember his name right now, but the, uh, there have been several articles and books on uh, the... Um, introverted personality yeah. that does extremely well mm -hmm. in executive positions. But anyway, just a concise capture of what we're talking about, pivoting in terms of coming to the EMBA. Thanks. Sure. I really just did it to um, provide that contrast, mostly for external parties, because I was really wanting to sell myself to be able to say, I can work in a strategic business setting, but with just the art history degree and some of my work experience, it wasn't compelling. So I did it for the external, but what I got was so much greater. So ultimately the benefit was both internal, like I needed that education, accounting. Um, I love strategy and now I feel like I've got that really wonderful business, wonderful business foundation. So it was really to provide that extra texture, that contrast to my prior education for, for credentializing purposes. So both. Uh, both, okay, sorry, and, and Jeff is my teammate. <laughs> um, uh, I came to the EMBA program because at the time I thought I was gonna run a cancer diagnostics company mm. and I needed to have chops. And, I, and I, I had research chops, I understood you know, statistics, but I didn't understand accounting, which is why I love this man, because he made it understandable. Mm -hmm. um, I, need, I needed how to, understand financial statements and, and, and talk to sophisticated investors and, and convince them that they don't need to fire me and hire someone else to run the company that, that I built. So uh, it was after the EMBA program that, that the clinical trial didn't work. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I think, and I, I said this, this is a honest to God truth. I said after Ron's class, my tuition was, was you know, earned. Same. Uh, just that class, I, it opened my eyes to business in such a powerful way. And then all the rest was just a bonus. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> but I came, I came to get chops in, in cancer thinking, but, but this has opened my eyes to the world. And in the, the project we did in Shanghai, wow, wasn't that fantastic, right? Um, that was hugely helpful as I pivoted to Asia um, to understand the cultural differences and where to sit and how to think about um, titles and be respectful and um, that they're not wrong. People who don't have our culture mm -hmm. are not wrong. They're just different. Mm -hmm. and, and, and drop the arrogance and be humble and learn and appreciate other cultures. It's really necessary for me to be able to be successful. Jose, thank you for sharing your guys' stories. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I wanna follow up on something that Krista asked about 10, 15 minutes ago about, kind of talking about just when you have a lot of ideas and a lot of things going on. Um, and, and part of it is, I kind of think about at certain points, it seems like you're kind of moving towards something, whether it's a linear path or kind of making your quill and kind of going all over the place. But how much of that time needs to be kind of just sit, like sat down and kind of just thinking and kind of mapping out 
what the frontier looks like versus just going in and exploring and figuring out along the way. I know that's different for everyone, but I kind of want to hear from both of you just what your guys' experiences has been um, on either side of that spectrum. That's a great question. Want me to go? Yeah. I do think it's a very fine line between quilt and chaos. I will say that, right? <laughs> So I think that it's a great question, and for each person, it's so individual. But I am very much a student of life. I love evaluating. I always have. I've kind of been an old soul. So even younger years, I would be thinking, like, where do I want to be in a year? So even though I was pursuing things that might on the surface have looked, you know, maybe less business oriented, I think constantly asking yourself, what do you want your life to look like? You know, being intentional about how much money do you want to make? You know, when I left corporate America, actually to start my company, I sat with my old boss. She was so supportive and she was like, go, you got to do it. And we sat at City Garden and I said, I'm willing to take a third pay cut. Like I'm risk tolerant, but there's certain things that I won't do. And I said, I'll take a third pay cut. So I gave myself, I said, I'll do it for a year. And I could, if I don't have to work for the man, I'll make a third less. And then we'll see, we'll see what happens. And I ended up making three X that in the first year. And it was wonderful, but I kind of knew where my, where my basement was. And so I think everyone has to be real honest with themselves about their risk tolerance. So if you are trying things out and traveling the world, it's like, thinking about who you want to be in a few years from now, you may go do that, but then put a, put a kind of fine point on when that stops and when the rest of your life starts. And then, you know, that year or however long people travel, that will inform their future. But I was always doing things with the understanding that I want to study this degree now. And once I started feeling the, the pension or the hankering for business, I came here. Right, so it's like there's a fine line, like I said, between the quilt background and the chaos, but I think as long as you're continuing to study and evaluate against who you wanna be, what you want your life to look like, you can, you can map those things up to each other. But it, I, I do like your question because this will not just happen on its own. I say to the team a lot, like inertia tends to take over and then you wake up and five years later, it's like what happened? So I think intention over inertia would be my, my answer to that, you know, be, be mapping, be journaling, use the end of the year to be like, what happened? I had a killer time, but I maybe didn't get to my business goals that this year is all about that. And our company every year for our size of company, I get a lot of kudos from our team where they've worked at other companies and they go, I've worked at huge companies. We don't have twice yearly strat sessions where we sit around the table and like shut everything else out and talk about who you know, themes for the back half of the year. And so whether that's professional or personal, I, I think that's really important to staying the course and showing up ultimately how you want your life to look like. So my, my answer to that question, um, in, a, in a company, you have, to, you have to make hard commitments um, to do a project. You're gonna spend 50, $60 million on it. Uh, so you really can't drop it to pursue another idea because it's there. I mean, you're, that's a hard commitment. And you really think a lot about all the different commitments you can make. But once you lock in, you're locked in. The ideas and all the options come to how do you do that? How do you win? How do you pursue this idea in the most excellent way? And there was a, a, a wonderful um, lecture at the Ember program. And I, I, it was in strategic thinking about, I don't know, it was on, how do you navigate an uncertain future? How do you lead a company where the markets are uncertain? And the tech, the illustration was probe and learn. So basically you stand where you are, you get as much information as you can and you take your first step. And you're gonna gain information when you take that step. So you stop and you reassess and you redirect yourself and then you take the next step. And that, analogy has been incredibly useful in creating completely new markets. A cancer risk test for colon cancer just doesn't exist. Uh, there are genetic risk factors, but not epigenetic risk tests. So that was a completely new thing. Plant, you know, this is why the BBC did their piece on this, this, this test then plant idea. It's like doing precision medicine for plants. Your test has to be really cheap. You have to do it in the millions to make that work but it can be really profound, but no one has done it. So how do you do something the first time in this probe and learn idea? You don't have to know. Take your best guess, take a step, assess, redirect yourself, take your best guess, assess. And that way 
it's not so painful to, to rule things in or out. Because often you take your first step and you realize, you know, this other idea probably was more right than the one I used when I pursued to take the first step. So I'm going to incorporate that other idea here and redirect. Incremental risk taking. Yeah. I think there are analogies to both of what we're saying. That'll be your next panel. Yes. <clears throat> Sounds good. Probe and learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to, to add to that for one second, um, most of you are familiar with Stephen Blank, who wrote the uh, uh, Agile Startup, the Lean Startup. He indicated that when you start a business, you have a business plan and it could have eight, 10, 12 different dimensions. And he says, if you don't get the flywheel of success for your business plan, don't fire your marketing guy, fire the element of your business plan that isn't working. And the, the, and the word pivot really became popularized as a single change in your business plan on one dimension. So a pivot wasn't originally used in the social science in the business world as let's go into a new business. It's let's change one element we're going to probe and explore. And so that pivot in, in, the, in the startup world is a very thoughtful, focused process as opposed to, you know, kind of a scattergun approach. The baby out with the bathwater. That's a good point. So I, I was just uh, a little curious about the difficulty of moving from from St. Louis to Asia as I understand it you had to take your your management and probably some equipment and some lab people and some procedures and and everything and, and take it to a totally different culture and, and, and you as well maybe I thought you could you know tell us a few stories about that so actually um, we no one has moved um, we travel. <laughs> in fact, I got back three days ago and I'm really jet lagged. Um, <laughs> it's 14 hour time zone, 30 hour flights. Um, so basically what I found was that in America, um, we're really good at um, taking risks and trying new things and, and innovation. We excel at that. And, and um, in Asia, um, the team is really good at execution. And uh, th there's, some, there's some funny stories. Um, I, I have a friend, in, and I was given a talk in India, and he was a Chinese professor from Texas A&M, and, and it was, we were jet lagged, and we needed to get to bed. And I said, Jeff, uh, I'm going to go to bed, or I'm, I'm going to have a really hard time at this conference, and we speak tomorrow, so let's go to bed. And you know, the early bird gets the worm. Mm. And he didn't know what that meant. And so I told, <laughs> explained to him that, you know, Birds come out, and the first bird, there's going to eat the worm in the ground. And when he understood what that expression meant, he laughed. I mean, he laughed way harder than he should have <laughs> laughed because it wasn't that funny. Yeah. And I'm like, Jeff, okay, come on. Why are you laughing so hard? He said, well, in China, we have another saying. It's the first bird gets shot. <laughs> <laughs> in Japan, it's the nail that sticks up gets hammered. <laughs> right? They're a collective society. You don't step out on your own or you're going to get your head ripped off. Um, here, you know, no risk, no re reward, right? First mover advantage. These are all cliches that, that, that sound natural, but no one talks like that over there. It's rare. And so what we did is we took advantage of the excellence in the workforce. And so our operational labs are in Asia. But all the R&D and innovation to improve tests and to make them more effective are here. So the international headquarters for R&D is based right up the street. We moved to the foundry from the Center for Emerging Technologies. It's a cool building. We love the foundry, city foundry. But the, you know, the labs that just, and actually when we bring a new protocol over, it's really difficult to get them to want to change because like, well, no, this, you always do it this way. You don't, and we have to, so my team travels over to bring new protocols and they leave once the team have been trained and then those guys execute without any errors in 11 blinded trials. No lab here could do that. And Zoom and virtual meetings, you know, we are up at late at night on phone calls because there, you know, it's 14 hours difference. So I, I have calls on both ends of the day and I, I have peace from like 10 a.m. to 4, 5, 5, 5 p.m. because they, they can't call me. 
I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, Rachel? Thank you. Thank you both for your awesome courage today, sharing your story, talking about a pivot is hard. I have a lot in common with you and uh, in a marketing background. So, but very intriguing about all the clinical studies. So thank you both for sharing, number one. And thank you, Ron. And uh, my question is about the EMBA community. We're celebrating 40 years of EMBA. And so the education that you get here is top notch. It's fantastic. I love it. It's been the, one of the most fascinating parts of my own personal transition. But there's also something that's within that educational piece. It's about the community. So how have you used your community, your EMBA community, to help you be successful moving forward? Your network, we talked a little bit about networking, but there's this beautiful space once you graduate as an alum how have you used that to bolster your success in your career? Take that. Sure. Well, I, uh, my teammate, Todd Spiener, is in the room. Um, Todd uh, is uh, an executive in the commercial paper space, was for years and years. He's, he's still doing things related to that. And uh, he, I was, he was saying, Nate, how do you finance your company? And I shared, and he looked at my cost of debt, and he was horrified, and he said, look, <laughs> Why don't we, why don't we, you know, use these assets and we'll, we'll back a loan and, and I can lower your cost of debt. And, and I think we got a huge facility that was very complex and it handled internet. Well, I just listened to Todd, actually. Um, <laughs> so uh, to be honest, the, the, the connections that I made in my class and at events like this have been hugely helpful. Um, our website was designed by a recommendation from one of the marketing team members in my class. Um, many of the pearls of wisdom that um, a general counsel in our class would utter are quoted many times. So uh, I, I think the relationship side of the education was, I mean, I, I love the, the knowledge as well. I'd put it on par. I, I don't know which is better, mm -hmm. but they were both critical. And Todd's also responsible for the fact that I spent more at Cafe Napoli <laughs> in team meetings than I did on my tuition <laughs> for the Ember program, because they have a really good wine list over oh there. My <laughs> Got so into trouble. Funny. I would say I think that I'm happy that they're doing events like this because as I've had children and started my own business, I've kind of been heads down. I have a bit of a different experience where I've just been jamming. I love my peers. You know, um, they'll occasionally want to have lunch. I'm very much of like a one-on-one -on -one person. What's doing? How are you going? Saw that you switched jobs. So we've kept, I would say, like a strong network. I could probably do more, especially now that I feel more settled. Eight years into having my company, we're in a great spot. I can do a little bit more lift up and out and, and reach out. So I always know it's there, and I feel like I can do more to tap into it. It really is what you make of it. I love that example. My God, it doesn't get better than that. You saved him money. Like That alone mm -hmm. is just like a poster child for EMBA. But I mean, connections with the professors, anytime I see one of them speaking or I can come and just like expand my mind and really just know that because I did go to the undergrad in Philadelphia, I don't have that here. So for me, it's like, what do they have going? What can I go to speak at? And I love my mom friend and physician and very talented colleague, Christina. She just said, I just graduated. And it's like, I like the inter-class exchange. I would love to see more of, you know, in between the, the EMBA classes, really collaborating and networking. So wanting to do more of that. Well, uh, thank you very much. So I have two requests of you. First is join me in a thunderous applause for our panel. Thank you so much. And uh, the second thing, uh, the third thing will be you'll be rewarded with a beverage. Uh, but number two, I'd like to do something that's completely off script. Those of you who are willing, I'd like you to come up, stand in front of the screen with our panel where you can get a picture. 